Okay, greetings one last time from Qatar, and I'll be back next class. Um, our learning objectives for today is going to be explain bend testing for ceramics and describe the difference between three versus four point bending. We will predict the mechanical response of materials as a function of porosity, temperature, and strain rate. We will describe non-Newtonian viscoelastic response in polymers. We, we referred to this last class. We're going to talk more about it now. And then we'll identify the glassy transition temperature for viscoelastic materials and use hardness as a non-destructive characterization technique. Okay? So last time we left off talking about toughness and we said that it's the area under the curve. So if you have your stress versus strain curve, stress versus strain, and you've got a material, it's going to have an elastic region. And after that point, it's going to start to permanently deform. You maybe do something like this. And once it does fracture, this area under that whole curve, that is your toughness. Okay? So we can think of applications for this, right? Like how about armor on ships and stuff or bugs? Bugs have evolved that when they fall off of things and they hit their back, that they don't just break, right? They, we want a tough material. So if you look at clams and bug shells, they typically have some really cool structures. Like take a look at this one. I think this is a seashell you have layers of calcium carbonate, and then you've got a biopolymer between those layers, right? And so it's made of a bunch of tiny layers like that. Well, think of what would happen. As a crack were to try and propagate through this material, it might have to actually move and break like you see is happening in that image. So it's gonna deflect the crack. Well, what do we know about fracture toughness, right? K1C, the larger that value, the more resistant it is to fracture. So a material like this, which is a composite made up of both ductile and brittle materials, overall can be fairly tough. It can resist fracture because it deflects that crack length and it slows it down from just propagating all the way through like it would in, say, a glass. Okay. Um, so they've come up with lots of different way, ways to think about this in the composites community, where they take different layups of different wood and they arrange them in different ways. They might do layers but they might do like uh, different types of composites, which I guess we'll get to later on in the semester, which can totally change the properties. Okay, let's talk about mechanical properties of ceramics for a minute. So because ceramics tolerate no strain at all, they fracture so easily, it can be hard to measure the properties that we do care about there. Like um, Young's modulus, for example, can be hard to measure because they fracture so easily. You couldn't do a dog bone test because if this is your dog bone and you tried to grab onto it and then grab onto it and pull it, it would just fracture right where you grab onto it. I mean, take a pair of vice grips and squeeze onto a dinner plate and you'll see that it just explodes. So we need a better way to do it. You need something where you don't have to pinch your material and squeeze onto it. So dog bones aren't gonna work well, but you could instead do three or four point bending. Here's how it works. You've got your sample. As you can see in this image, you apply loads in a way that it creates a bending moment in your material, right? You've got one force at the top, and then you've got force divided by two on these two bottom posts. Force divided by two. What that does, it creates a bending moment in your material that increases up to a maximum, and then it decreases, right? Or in other words, there's one point in your material that experiences a maximum bending moment. That's right here. That's where your maximum bending moment is if you're doing three-point bend tests, okay? So doing this, if you know the dimensions of your sample, the width, the height, the separation distance between those, those points, you can actually calculate something that we call the modulus of rupture. The modulus of rupture is gonna be three times the force times the length separation between those divided by two times the, let's see, two times the width multiplied by the height squared. Okay, that will give you the modulus of rupture. And this turns out to be, you know, we'd, we'd rather just do tensile testing, but since we can't, this becomes a pretty useful thing for brittle materials, high modulus brittle materials. So you can do this in different ways. You can do it in three point bending or four point bending. So over here, here's your three point bending. It's just what I just showed you. But you could also load it like this in four point bending, where now you've got a force and a force. You've got forces like that. So what would the difference be? So think about it for a minute. If you apply the exact same load to your sample, should there be any difference? Well, if you look at it, you can calculate it. If you've taken statics, you learned how to do this. You can calculate the total force on it, doing a force diagram, but you can also do a bending moment diagram. And from the bending moment diagram, we already showed you that for a three-point bending, it increases to a maximum and then it decreases. But in four-point bending, it increases to a maximum. It stays there 
and then it would go down. Or in other words, you have this entire region of your sample, and that whole region is exposed to some maximum bending moment, as opposed to a single point. So now think about what that means in terms of design. If you have a flaw in your material, let's say you've got a big flaw right there and a big flaw right here, which one's it going to break at? It's definitely going to break right there because that's where your maximum bending moment is, even though a big flaw existed somewhere else. Well, here, if you've got a huge flaw here and a, you have a huge flaw there and a small flaw in the middle, it'll break here as opposed to that one in the middle, right? So it's just a better way to test it because it exposes a larger volume of your sample to a maximum bending moment. So four point bending is better, but it typically requires bigger samples because uh, the bar separation is a little bit big. So if you can do four point bending or three point bending, four point bending is typically better because it's testing a bigger section of your sample as opposed to testing one very small middle section, which is not as useful, okay? Um, okay. So when ceramics are fully dense, you can get one set of properties, but it's very common to get ceramics that are not fully dense. This is because they have residual porosity left over. Why? Well, when you make ceramics, you start with powders, usually. There's other ways to do it, but it's common to start with powders, and then you sinter these together, so the particles slowly come together. We call this process sintering, and this is the densification going from particles to now some dense body. And you can actually see this uh, in bubble raft videos. Back in the 50s, scientists that didn't have the microscopes we have today that wanted to test this stuff, they'd make rafts of bubbles representing atoms. And take a look at this. You can see these different regions. When they remove the thing that was holding them in place, they slowly start to come together. See how these regions are disappearing, these little regions in the middle? Those slowly disappear. And you can see that you get different... Here's the grain boundaries between the different crystalline regions that weren't perfectly oriented before, so you're left with these grain boundaries between them. And if you're lucky, then you completely get rid of these pores, right, in this sintering process. But sometimes it's challenging to completely get rid of those because it requires really high temperatures or long times, and so they get left behind. So if you do make a ceramic and you don't get rid of these pores entirely, what's that going to do to your mechanical properties? Well. What it does to your mechanical properties is the following. So here you can see the elastic modulus as a function of the volume fraction of porosity that's left in it. Obviously, if there's no pores, you're going to have the stiffest ceramic possible, right? It'll have some value here. But as you introduce pores, it sort of falls off like this, sort of asymptotically decays. Looks like an exponential decay. And in fact, you can fit it. In this case, they fit it with a polynomial, but you can fit these things oftentimes with an exponential as well. And the strength, the strength falls off too. Why should the strength fall off? Well, again, think about it. If you've got a pore in your material, that's a flaw, right? That's going to increase the odds of it fracturing. And if you have more and more of these things, you might get three or four of them that together act like one big flaw. Right? And so that's why your strength really falls off as you have more and more porosity. Okay? So there's some experiments that they've shown on a variety of materials showing typical type of behavior for that. Okay? Now let's talk about polymers. We've talked about uh, ceramics and metals a little bit. Let's talk about polymers. We saw this with the banana demo that the properties that you get can make it look like a ceramic, right? If you do that at high strain rate or low temperature. Or they can look like a rubber band, like an elastomer, if you do them at high temperature and low strain rate, right? So it just totally depends. The conditions upon which you test your ceramic or your polymer can really influence the type of properties that you observe, okay? So here's polymer. Here's, here's a real example. This is PMMA, I think. Let's see. Yeah, polymethyl methacrylate. If you do it at 4 degrees Celsius or 40 Fahrenheit, just above freezing, it looks like a ceramic. You heat it up to 68, 86, 104, 122, 140. It transitions all the way across. Look at the maximum elongation over here is like small, 0 0.05, no, 0 0.025 strain. Um, whereas over here it strains all the way out to 1.3. So it becomes very, it, it flows basically at that point. So totally different properties depending on how you test them. Okay. So some typical values, remember that your modulus is something like less than four or five gigapascals for a polymer, whereas metals are 100 to 400 gigapascals typically. The tensile strength of polymers is much, much lower. Most polymers are not strong. There's exceptions. It's something like maybe 100 megapascals, where metals might be four gigapascals, right? 
And then the elongation, you can in some polymers you can achieve a thousand percent elongation, whereas metals it's typically less than a hundred percent elongation before they break. So what allows a polymer to stretch so much, and why is it such lower stress to break them apart? Well, think of what happens during deformation. So here you have a polymer in its molten state, and if there's no orientation, then the polymers are just randomly every which way. Okay. Now, as you start to pull on this, what you're going to start to see is that they start to thin down for one thing, and these polymers start to line up a little bit, and they're going to increasingly line up as you deform it. So imagine your spaghetti, your bowl of spaghetti noodles. You just grab on the noodles, and when you start to pull it, they're going to start to line up, and some might start to slide past one another. That's what allows you to get such crazy deformation is because you can align these molecules and maybe even slide them past each other if they haven't been heavily cross-linked. Okay? Now, many polymers exhibit a really interesting phenomenon we talked about last time, which is viscoelastic. And what do we say about this? We said that when you initially apply a stress as a function of time, most materials you expect, okay, you apply a stress, you see an instantaneous stress, right? If we apply the stress instantly and we take it away instantly, then what you'd expect to see for a elastic material is you see an instantaneous elastic strain. And the second you take that stress off, it drops to zero and now it stays at zero. But viscoelastic materials don't behave that way. They behave in a sort of funny way. There's an initial strain, right? But then it sort of keeps on rising. As long as that stress is present, it keeps on stretching, right? And then when you kill it, it drops a little bit, but it doesn't drop down to zero. Instead, it sort of decays back to some value. That's viscoelastic behavior. Compare that to viscous, where you, as long as the stress is applied, it just keeps on straining. And then as soon as it's gone, it just stays there. That would be viscous. So viscoelastic, as you can see, it lies somewhere between viscous behavior and elastic behavior. And it's characterized by this sort of time-dependent deformation as you load and unload things. So why do we care about this? What is it good for, right? Um, it's good because lots of materials have this, right? Let's say you made a, a motorcycle part and you, you bolted it on it and needed to have some stress or it could withstand some stress. But then you find that after five or six years, it breaks even though it never went be of, above that stress. What happened is it was probably flowing, right? It got weaker over time. So let's say you use like a, a plastic bolt, right? A plastic bolt, which you expect to be able to hold some stress, it's actually, when it holds that stress, it's slowly getting longer. Your bolt is stretching out if you have a plastic bolt. So over time, your tolerances will change. So viscoelastic materials are important. And we know from what we've said so far that both temperature and strain rate can influence them, right? That you can get very different properties as you change both temperature and the rate at which you load things. So how do you decouple them for studying? Well, you fix one variable and then you vary the other. For example, you could fix temperature, right? Take a single temperature, you can strain your polymer, measure the stress, right? The whole stress versus strain curve there, and then pick another temperature and repeat that process. In each case, the strain rate would need to be constant. Right? You're using the same strain rate, but you're changing the temperature, right? Or you could go the other way. Pick one temperature and change the strain rate and measure a bunch of different experiments, okay? In this process, you can, do, uh, you can measure something called stress relaxation. So let's say you take a polymer, right? You strain it. So you start it out that length. You now strain it to that length, okay? So this was your L initial. This is your L final. You could calculate a strain. And therefore, you know what the stress is if you know what the modulus of your material is. So you know that in this strained state, it has some stress. We'll call that sigma naught. So on day one, when you stress that, it has some stress in the material. But what happens is that over time, if it's a viscoelastic material, the polymer line, the polymers just like slowly start to slide past each other, and the stress that was initially present, it starts to decay. So the stress as a function of time, this is now your stress at any given time, it depends on what your initial stress was, but then it's also going to depend on the modulus of material, the time, and the viscosity. And the viscosity is something we'll talk about a little bit more next chapter. Um, okay? So we'll come back to this equation a little bit later. Let's mark it for now. That's something that we could probably use on a homework. Okay? That's stress relaxation.
Um, so what you do is, like I said, you could pick um, a bunch of different temperatures and test your materials at all these different temperatures, right? You get all these different curves. You could then put those together, right? When you put those together, you can create what's called this um, time temperature transition. When you put all this, when you put all this together, you end up with this glassy transition curve where the, any material that's viscoelastic will typically have a curve that looks like this. It'll start out with a high modulus, it will fall, it'll have this glassy plateau, right? And then it will become viscous flowing if you heat it up enough. This is a very typical sort of curve, okay? So again, you've got your glassy state up here. Here's your glassy transition. When it starts to go from something that looks like a ceramic to something that's flowing, not like a ceramic would, you have this leathery region. This is your rubbery plateau. Sorry, that, not, not your glassy plateau. That's your rubbery plateau. And then if you heat it up enough, it might actually start to flow like a liquid. So these transitions from something that looks like brittle caramel, like cold caramel is brittle, to now rubbery caramel, to now flowing caramel when you heat it up enough, this is a, these are characteristics of visco, viscoelastic materials. Okay? So this glassy transition temperature, the temperature at which you start to transition there, that's an important thing to be able to measure. That would be important to know. If you have a polymer, you want to know at what point it stops behaving like a rigid material and starts behaving like something that's going to be leathery or rubbery. So the way that we define that temperature, we define Tg, the glassy transition temperature, as the point at which the viscosity becomes 10 to the 12th Pascal seconds. So totally arbitrary. We say that's the viscosity. As soon as it's at that viscosity, it's too flowy to consider it as a glass. It must start behaving more like a leather or a rubber material, okay? So again, in the glassy region, they're frozen in position. The polymer chains can't slide past each other. But if you give it enough temperature, then in the viscous regions, they start to be able to vibrate, rotate, maybe even flow past one another, okay? So let's consider four different polymers and let's sketch what the glassy transition curve would look like for four different polymers. So again, down here, this is temperature. This is modulus, okay? All right, for those four different materials, how are they going to look, okay? Well, what were our four materials? We started out with, okay, it's crystalline, and it's isotactic. What did isotactic mean? Isotactic meant that all of the side groups are on the same side, right? So if you have polystyrene, all, that styrene group is all, always on the same side. It's isotactic. Now you've got cross-linked atactic. Atactic means it's random, but now this time these chains are cross-linked together occasionally. So there's something holding the chains together at spots. And then you've got low and high molecular weight atactic. So atactic means that it doesn't care which side it's on, so it's random. You got low and high molecular weight. So how are these things gonna compare? Well, the one that's gonna be the glassiest at the highest temperatures and be the most um, stiff will be the one that is bonding the best. Which one of these will bond the best? Well, if all the side groups are on the same side, that's gonna encourage bonding. So isotactic is better than either of the atactics. So let's draw it first. It might look something like this. Okay. That is our crystalline isostatic. That is our crystalline isotactic, right? It's glassy, but even when it transitions from a glassy to a rubbery material, it still has a high modulus. Relative to the other materials, let's say something like this, it starts out glassy, but then you get this behavior, right? So that would be low molecular weight. The high molecular weight might do something like that. So this is low MW versus high MW. Notice that both these materials, they become, they go through their glassy transition at lower temperatures because they're not as well bonded. In their rubbery state, they're much more compliant than the isotactic crystalline material. And then how will the, the cross-linked atactic material look? Well, if it's cross-linked, it will never actually flow, right? So this is cross-linked. Right? Does that make sense how you could sketch curves like these for these glassy transitions? Again, it has to do with bonding. 
the more crystalline a material is because it has nice groups all on the same side, the more like a ceramic it's going to look until it melts and then it's going to flow. These things are also going to flow, but it's going to happen at lower temperatures, right? Because they're lower molecular weight and because they're not as crystalline because the side groups don't line up as well, then they're going to be less stiff even in their rubbery state. But in the glassy state, they're all going to look pretty similar. Cross length, its only difference is that even when you heat it up enough, it'll never start to flow because those chains are stapled together with those little linkers, right? They're cross-linked together. Um, viscoelastic creep is important to consider because if things are basically, if polymer chains can sort of slide past each other over long time scales, this can lead to problems, right? Maybe you've noticed an old camper. Campers have these, like on tires. They'll have flat stoppers because that camper's parked in a spot for a long time. Maybe you only go camping a couple times a year with your camper. That means your tire is sitting there with all the stresses on that tire. And even though it's cross-linked and you don't expect it to flow, it's going to flow a little bit. And if you have a lumpy tire, that's not something you want to drive with. It's not going to get good fuel efficiency. It's not going to be comfortable. So they have flat stoppers to prevent flats from forming in your tires because it helps prevent that strain by mitigating the stresses that it's on by putting it in a curved shape. Okay. Now the last thing we're going to cover uh, before uh, next class is going to be hardness. Hardness can be defined a lot of different ways. It can be, it's most commonly defined as a material's resistance to plastic deformation that's localized. So like scratches and dents, a hard material won't be scratched or dented. Um, why do we like hardness is because it's something that's easy and cheap to measure. You don't need a great big dog bone that's cut to a certain dimension. And when you pull on it, you both neck it down and break it so it's destructive. Hardness is typically non-destructive because you've got your material and you're just going to dent a little spot in it, right? Um, it's cheap, it's easy, it's non-destructive, and it is a, it can be used to estimate other properties like yield strength just by denting it. So how does it work? You typically start with an indenter. You might have something like in the Vickers method where it's sort of a pyramid-shaped indenter, something like diamond, and you take that indenter and you press it into your material, and you monitor how much force did it require to press into your material to create some sort of indent in the material. If you look down on the material down here, you'll see that it has some sort of dimensions in the indent. Now you can also do that with a spherical tip or lots of different types of tips made of lots of different materials. And this leads to the different types of hardness that you'll see reported. Sometimes you'll see people talking about Brunel hardness or Rockwell hardness or Vickers hardness. These are all basically doing the exact same thing. They're all taking a tip, pressing into your material and measuring either how deep down it goes or what's the area of the indentation left over afterwards just with different approaches, right? But they're all nice and easy to do um, and it's pretty useful. And nowadays we actually have nano indenters which can do really cool things. I'll show you an image. So with nano indentation, you can actually use, so it looks kind of like a microscope. It often is a microscope and you've got a little tip right inside of there. What's great about it is with nano indentation, you have your tip and you can press individual areas, right? So if you look here, you can see that they were to press at a really small scale. The indentation is only five microns big and you can do even much smaller than that. So let's say that you have a material with lots of different grains and you know which orientation the different grains have. You've got a 100 grain and a 111 grain. So the orientation of those is different. You can test the hardness on those different grains and figure out how they behave differently. So that's really useful. And then also you can do this, right? You can actually get the whole stress versus strain curve. This is the force versus displacement. So you could turn that into a stress versus strain curve. So you can get things like modulus. You can get lots of other values out of nano indentation. And so this is something you should be aware of. And we actually have one here at the University of Utah up in the NanoFab, which is a great tool to use so you can be aware of. Okay, so this is where we'll leave off for today. And we'll pick up next time talking about a super cool thing, which is how do you deal with variability in test data? You're testing all these things and you get this spread in your numbers. What do we do with that? We'll pick up there next time.